Hey everyone, this is Kurt Havens and this is the Atomic Life Channel. And today we are here with Wesley Vissers. I'm sure most of you know who Wesley is. He's headed to the Olympia in what, 14 days now? Yeah, exactly. 14 days out from the Classic wow, Physique man. Olympia. I'm very excited for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on, man. We wanted to talk about some of the basics of what it's like to be a bodybuilder on a day-to-day -day basis, how you decide food and other things that go into this and just generally like what your life is like you know you've accomplished a ton by the age of 30 already yeah thank you very much and yeah. and that all comes down to having a solid routine and i think that could be interesting to a lot of people to hear that it's just not just a temporary routine but it's one i've been following pretty much since since i started bodybuilding which is when i turned 20 that's when i did my first show so before that, of course, I did uh, strength training in the gym and I still grew muscle, but the thought of actually being a competitive bodybuilder was not in my mind yet. But once you step on the stage and you see the changes that nutrition alone already makes in your physique, mm -hmm. then you start to implement a routine because without a routine of eating every single meal correctly on time, sleeping correctly, training correctly, if that is not in place, the, the competitors, your competition will actually overtake you. And that's the last thing you want because the first show I actually, I won as a junior, the overall at that show. And then you already set the bar for yourself. Okay. This is now the bar. I can't go below this because now expectations are high and that only strengthens uh, the desire to do everything perfectly. And of course I was still young, inexperienced, but bodybuilding has changed my life since i did the first show because i actually my education at that time i was doing communication and multimedia design <laughs> so something very different but once i realized the importance of nutrition and how it made you feel how it made you look how it made you perform in the gym i actually switched my study from that to uh, nutrition and dietetics oh. so right now i'm actually a sports dietitian officially so that's always a nice title to have, not just a bodybuilder who's interested in nutrition, but also with a back scientific background to back up something that you say it's not just uh, out of the blue, but it's actually it supported by science. thinking about it in science. So yeah, the routine is very important in that aspect for sure. Yeah. And I saw, I've been following you for years now since you were an amateur. And I think that the two things that really struck me about you were your when you talk about your routine your food i always thought your food was really neat because you spent that extra time to really you were always cooking your own food and you were adding yeah. a little extra to it right like your golden rice and yeah eating more fish right like a lot of the guys at least in the united states it's more chicken it's more just yeah. plain rice everything's very boring True. bland with health is not necessarily a concern and you always seem like someone who cared more about their health in addition yeah. to bodybuilding and the other thing was your conditioning. You were a guy that was always crisp, even in the off season. Yeah. Your look is much drier than most of the guys that I see, which I really appreciate. I just think it adds to the beauty of bodybuilding to keep that look. Yeah, I was, I, of course, I love classic bodybuilding. And I, when I, when you watch like pumping iron and you see Arnold, they never look off. They always look good year round. And that's the look I wanted as well. But it kind of happens automatically if you eat healthy in the off season, because there literally is no room for like a big off meal or, or cheating too much, because even though the nutrition was more healthy, it was also more delicious. So the cravings that it could actually be caused by deficiency in a certain micronutrient, you don't have those cravings anymore because you already look forward to the next meal. That's actually going to be healthy. Like an example would be, and most people might not even be able to understand this, but like the variety in vegetables or spices and herbs can make the exact same meal. Like for example, cod with rice and vegetables. You have that meal twice. The macros are pretty much the same, but the vegetables change like you go from bell pepper, asparagus, celery to like uh, 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 broccoli with onion and a bit of garlic, but the colors change. So the appearance changes, the, the, like the individuals change. You already think it's a different kind of meal. 
you add different kind of spices like you have a like you mentioned the golden rice like you can make golden rice with turmeric adding turmeric to it to it or curry powder or paprika powder making it all taste differently but all of those ingredients add different micronutrients and phytonutrients to the meal which if you do that every single day you always get from each micronutrient some in and if you on top of that supplement a little bit with extra vitamins and minerals you need as a bodybuilder a, a bit more of then you're pretty much set and in my opinion that makes it so much easier to follow a diet knowing that it's more healthy but also that it require uh, it fills that requirement of the micronutrients panel panel up more which in turn makes you a more healthy person so it's just a win-win situation and i love that when you see the meals and they look appetizing it's going to be easier to eat because uh, you mentioned that yeah that the food looks appetizing and people when i post it as a story they always ask me how do you make that how do you make golden rice it's literally one ingredient <laughs> yeah. but people simply don't put the effort or the thought into it that it's even possible to create something so easy and it barely adds any flavor but it does make it more visually appealing which makes the whole meal transformed compared to like of course your typical chicken white rice and broccoli which is dry and boring Gross. and void of a lot of the micronutrients you need as a bodybuilder right and i think that's that's something a lot of guys struggle with is right when they first learn how to do this they have to learn how to eat repetitively right multiple times yeah. a day much different yeah. than most people eat and i think to change it up and make it healthier and more flavorful in the colors and stuff you know it just adds that variety makes life a lot easier you know yeah. you and i talked about that we both enjoy cooking mm -hmm. right and i think that that also helps too is if you learn to love the preparation of this food it becomes part of that process as a bodybuilder if you're creating the nutrients that are going to allow you to grow yeah by spending time in the kitchen versus just a restaurant and ordering whatever someone else made for you uh, true true so what what is your normal weight in the off season versus your show weight all right so right now in the off season it's going to be around 130 kilos okay. which i believe is above 280 pounds or so but remember i am pretty much six three so pretty tall one of the taller guys in classic physique at the olympia and on stage, I'm maximally allowed to weigh 112.9 kilos or 249 pounds. So as everybody probably knows, there was a weight increase. But for, for the taller guys, it was almost nothing because it was only two pounds for me or zero, 0 0.9 kilos. So, you know, most people think, oh, that's nothing. But what it does for me, it allows me to eat two meals extra before the weigh-ins. So that actually can make or break your physique, especially when you have a competition the next day. And for a tall guy like me, I need to be filled up in yeah. order to showcase my physique to the fullest. So that little increase in weight does allow me to look a lot better on the show day. But yeah. uh, even though my off-season weight gets you know, quite up there, if you look at the absolute numbers, if you look at my conditioning, and the look, it's still pretty respectable. I always try to keep lines in the quads. Even like from the sides, you can still see lines in the glutes. And the abdominal area is still clean. Like you don't see any rolls <laughs> when you yeah. sit down. So, and the veins are always showing on the arms, stuff like this. Just like I mentioned about the old school bodybuilders, they simply always look uh, visually appealing. Like when you walk on the beach, people still recognize, oh, that's just, that's a bodybuilder. So that's yes. always what I like to look like. And automatically, since I'm so close to the weight limit already, it's no use for me to eat so much more in the off season yeah. because I need to lose that weight then anyway. So it's yeah. only going to be uh, extra trouble for me when I go into a contest prep. Yep. Yeah, I know people, you know, I know when Chris Bumstead posted his food, people questioned that that's all that he ate, but it's the same as you. Why would you need to eat more? It's not going to be beneficial yeah. if you, you lose, you know, because we've all done that. We've all gone way over where we should be in the off season weight wise. And then you yeah. have to lose a ton of weight. I had to lose 50 pounds one year, which I'm a short guy, 50 pounds, a ton of weight. Yeah. I yeah. to get rid of. Yeah. And it just makes it miserable. And, and you also keep your stomach nice and tight year round. You know, yeah. that was something that then it blows your stomach out. It's harder to hit True. a vacuum and all those things when you've yeah. stretched all your organs out. Uh, so when does prep normally start for you? You start 20 weeks out, 16 weeks? 
at least at least 20 weeks. That's when I would like to start. And I actually like to start quite heavily in the caloric deficit right from the get-go. Because okay. I think then you have most of your energy left. You have a lot of fat tired. stores, obviously, compared to the end of prep. And it's a break from the off-season, basically, also. Even when you go like... 30 40 percent less calories you're still not really hungry the first couple of weeks because i need to eat around six thousand calories in the off season which for most people is quite a lot and since i eat mostly clean it's also a lot of volume and i but i love to eat at the same time so it's like a weird thing that i am always full but whenever i make a meal i always want to add plenty of vegetables and or plenty of fruits to make sure i also get those micronutrients and if you if that's all the requirements of a meal, okay, it has to make, uh, contain enough carbs, enough protein, enough micronutrients, enough fiber. They're always going to be high volume meals, regardless yeah. of how you try to make them. So it's always going to be big meals. So I'm uh, I don't mind when the ca- when the carbs go cut in half, for example, because I find I lose no performance in the gym. The only thing that I feel more comfortable with is like less of a tight stomach. Like you can actually, when you when you pose, you can uh, hit your vacuum better. You don't feel that as much stuff is in the way yeah. in your intestines and yeah. things just feel more smooth. You feel actually more energized, at least for me, yeah. the first couple of weeks in prep compared to deep in the off season. So uh, yeah, that, I like to start at least 20 weeks out to ensure that I have enough runway before the peak week starts that I'm actually already done a few weeks before so that I, yeah, so I can actually eat back up as far as my weight limit allows me to eat back up. That is, that's the only kind of difficult aspect about the weight limit that you are not true, truly free in looking at your shape. So you also have to look at the weight and sometimes that doesn't align perfectly, but we're still managing pretty well. Yeah. I classic stuff. That's what I typically done too. And the weight class is always hard to make. Yeah. You, you mentioned something interesting too about when you were listing what goes into a meal. And I just thought it was an interesting point that you didn't mention fat. So one of the common things I see now is that the majority of guys that look great from pro level bodybuilder to fitness enthusiast, the majority of us eat about the same way day in and day mm-hmm. out, right? And it tends to be some sort of moderate to high protein, some sort of moderate to high carbohydrate diet. And it tends to be lower in dietary fat. And I just, I think it would be interesting to hear you reiterate that because I think there's a lot of confusion out there. I argue with guys all the time that think that doing some sort of carnivore or doing some sort of keto diet is really the best way to do this. And I've never personally met anyone that looks great at any level that really diets like that. No, no. Yeah. The, like there's also the discussion, of course, natural versus enhanced Mm -hmm. yeah natural you might need a little more Mm -hmm. fat to produce those hormones from but once you are advanced you're literally replacing those fats you would eat with with fats you pretty much inject so and the hormones already made for you in fact basically so you don't have to worry about those the only thing i do believe in is the essential amino essential fatty acids in a form of uh i take a lot of omega-3 so with each I uh, always take extra omega-3 capsules, and my last meal of the day is always a Nordic salmon, uh, so it's like a salmon uh, f- uh, fillet of at least 200 grams, which contains probably you know, in between 20 and 30 grams of fat, depending on which cut you, you take, because mm. there's a lot of variety there as well. But uh, I source it from a reputable source to make sure that it's you know high in omega-3 fatty acids, that it's healthy, low in uh, heavy metals. Because uh, a little bit of a side tangent, you mentioned that I ate white fish before, that you saw me eating mm-hmm. more fish. I did that for seven years straight. But then I did a blood test to test my mercury just to oh. see if it's too high. And before I got the results, they actually called me up and they wondered if I was working in a factory that works oh, no. with mercury equipment or with like mercury stuff in general. And I was like, no, no, I don't. But I do eat like uh, a few pounds of fish a day. <laughs> and then they were like, oh, okay, okay. That makes a bit more sense now because I think it was like 25 times over the maximum limit. And I remember uh, a few weeks before I saw on YouTube somebody, a bodybuilder, who had mercury poisoning. And he talked about the horrible side effects he 
experienced. Luckily, I didn't experience anything, but it was a red flag tell, telling me that, okay, I've been a pescatarian basically for seven years straight. I had, I ate no chicken, no beef at all because I thought, well, white fish, uh, like chicken is chicken, but with white fish, you have cod, you have pollock, you have so many different kinds, tuna, salmon, trout. You can uh, have so much variety that I didn't really crave any other meats. I never was a big meat eater when I was a kid. So I actually transitioned to eating fish as a bodybuilder and I never changed. But seeing those levels, it, you know, let the alarm bells ring basically. And then I was like, okay, maybe I got to switch to a bit of chicken now and some red meats to uh, offset this level. And uh, I also added, like, I think it was parsley and some other herbs, like we're going back to the herbs again, yeah. to help chelate some of those heavy metals mm -hmm. and get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Also, like, chlor how, how do you call that green powder? Like chlorophyll or something? Or oh, yes. Something yeah. yep. It's what makes... Yep. Yeah. Chlorophyll. Yeah, and that, that uh, helped bring it down drastically. And right now, it's already within regular range, wow. which I'm very happy about. And okay. I haven't eaten tuna since then, because okay. I know that tuna, yeah. I think it was the biggest factor in that. Because in fact, I went to Portugal in 2021, and I always take my, my protein sources frozen with me. And I happen to have a lot of tuna steaks in the fridge. And I was like, okay, let's just finish all of these. So I literally, every single day, I probably had like four to six tuna steaks wow. every day for like two yeah, weeks straight. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> I think stuff like that really caused a higher level of mercury. So even when you think you eat very healthily, if you don't, have enough variety, even in the protein source, it can still cause some bad stuff to happen. Yeah. But then again, it isn't the fish itself. It's the environment that caused like pretty much us as humans polluting the environment, polluting the fish, and then you pollute yourself. So it's not actually the protein source itself, but it's the environment they live in and yeah. eventually the buildup of heavy toxins in the fish and then you eat it. So... But yeah, going back to the fats, wow. so the only meal of the day that is higher in fat would be the last meal of the day, which would make the most sense to me because then you eat for the, you don't eat for the longest period of time, like at least eight to 10 hours you don't eat. So you might as well have a little bit more protein, a little bit more fat to slow down the digestion so you don't wake up too hungry. I also uh, ramp up the vegetables in that meal. And that meal is the only meal I try to keep without carbs for as long as possible to maximize the carbs around the workout. And only when I plateau in my weight, I'll add some carbs to the last meal as well. Okay. So uh, that's pretty much the only thing I do in terms of fat. I don't really add much other fat to my uh, to my meals because I think the carbohydrates, that's the performance driver, yeah. of course, of your workouts and the fats. Like I ha I, I've had periods when I was less experienced, when I did add like olive oil or dark chocolate or nuts or stuff like this or avocado to my meals. And it's because I thought it was like healthy fats. That's healthy for you. But yes. how much do you actually need? need. It really yes. wasn't ever specified for bodybuilders. And when I took it out, it gave me more room for carbohydrates. Yeah. And I got fuller, more energy for the gym, more performance. The workouts, yeah, the workouts could last longer, more energy towards the end of the workout. So it only brought me benefits and my lab work with cholesterol and triglycerides actually improved even. So it only got me benefits instead of downfalls regarding like yep. getting in your healthy fats because you only need a little bit to you know, fulfill those needs. You've probably heard us talk about that before. Paul and I've talked about that. It's, it, that's where people misunderstand that, right? They're like, but it's a healthy fat, right? Avocados are healthy. It doesn't mean <laughs> yeah. you need a ton, especially like you said, if you're enhanced, you need even less, right? Where you're yeah. not, you don't really need the cholesterol and the fat really to synthesize anything. So what does, um, what does prep look like for you for 20 weeks? If you're doing cardio year round, you're walking. I, tr I, I do. I always try to keep my walks at around 10,000 steps a day, even in the off season, maybe towards the end, it goes down to 8,000, but it's hard to actually go below 10,000. I have two children and I always do like a morning walk of 30 minutes, an after dinner walk. And I always like to get a walk in before bed. So three big walks and I walk in between the sets in the gym. And then by the end of the day, it's pretty much standard at 10,000 already, if not more. Yeah. So that's already always like a foundation of movement, which I think is very good for you for blood sugar management and digestion and stuff. 
But uh, the cardio, uh, last year, I had to do a lot of cardio. I uh, went down to 1,800 calories, and I did 90 minutes of cardio a day. And for my weight, that's quite a big deficit because I simply had to go down to that low body fat to beat guys like Michael the Bull and uh, extremely yeah. conditioned guys. Yeah. So I put a lot of pressure on myself. But once I achieved that level of conditioning last year, it, I felt it was a lot easier to get to that conditioning this year because at the beginning of the prep, I, men I mentioned I already lowered the carbs by quite a lot. I keep most of the carbs intact for as long as possible around the workout, so pre-workout and post-workout. Those carbs, I try to keep the same for as long as I can until those also need to go down. So at, at some point, like meal one or two is usually my pre- and post-workout, so like breakfast and meal two, they contain all of the carbs, and then meal three, Those maybe down. some, but then meal four, five, six, zero carbs, and eventually... Uh, four meals don't have any carbs, only meal one and two, and even those lower down in carbs, but yeah. never to zero. I haven't had to do that. I actually could stay to around 2,400 calories this time, which is a big bump compared to the 1,800, <laughs> and only half the amount of cardio. So that's also a big benefit. And actually having to use less fat burners and yep. additional things to help you burn that fat. So in terms of health, and fatigue, it was also a lot better this year too. So I slowly increased cardio from like week 20. It might start at 20 minutes every morning because I simply like to wake up, do my routine, simply start the cardio, do my posing check-in, then do the morning walk and then have breakfast. So you are up for at least one and a half hours before getting your breakfast. And the cardio slowly increases by 10 minutes every time until I hit 45. But by the time I hit 45 minutes, I already was in the shape I needed to be in. So the rest of the caloric deficit came from lowering the carbs and pretty much eliminating any fats that was in the diet before. So uh, the only time I like to add fats, mostly because I simply like the flavor, is like dark chocolate with my breakfast because I like to eat cream of rice, and if you put dark chocolate on it yeah, when it's still good. hot, it's it tastes a lot better. It's easier to get down, which is one of the reasons <laughs> why I added in the off season. But you know, at one point I remove those as well. So like those trace fats you still have added, I remove as well. So then it's basically a protein, vegetable, and a pre and post workout carb diet. And uh, luckily, I didn't have to. Uh, go to uh, uh, zero carb breakfast, which I did have to go to last year, like an omelet, for example. But now I had uh, two cream of rice meals around the workout, and I can live with that for sure. Luckily, I d I'm not a guy who gets extremely hungry, or maybe I can simply ignore it very well nowadays because I've done a lot of competitions already. But yeah, that's pretty much in terms of cardio and nutrition, what I like to do to get into a caloric uh, deficit. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and I think with the, the hunger thing you said before, I, I find it a lot of it's mental, right? A lot of guys yeah. mentally can't, you know, suffer. I, I don't know if that's the right word, but I think I, I always like dieting. I always like being leaner. I feel better the leaner I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't too. mind. It, I feel like you're more in touch with your surroundings too. When you have a little mm -hmm. bit of hunger versus, yeah. you know, in the off season when you're full all the time, you're kind of lazy and you're slow and mm -hmm. you can't think very well. But a lot of guys just can't focus, you know, or dedicate themselves to really feeling like that or getting that lean. They feel horrible, you know, and that's probably yeah. a limiting factor. Like we, you and I have talked previously about it being a genetic game as well, right? Like mm -hmm. you probably realized early on when you first started lifting weights, you responded really well to things yeah. versus most people just don't respond quite like that, right? No matter what goes into it. Yeah, usually you know if you're gen genetically blessed when people ask you what are you taking and yes. you're not even you you don't you're even know what they're genetic. talking about yeah. because back then i was i think 19 or 20 and someone asked me what are you on i'm like I, I had yeah i i had no idea what they were talking about and i didn't even know like i was even i thought ronnie coleman was natural that's my mindset back then because i thought I know. I if i know. keep if i keep progressing at this level like this, in 10 years, I might become something like a Ronnie Coleman because it went so quickly when I started and I didn't use anything. I relied on my uh, puberty testosterone, basically. Yeah. So it went so quickly. Of course, after a while, it starts, it starts to plateau. And that's when I realized, okay, with these competitions, I'm going to need an extra push in order to compete with the guys who are using. But it's always nice to know the first competition, winning the overall 
completely natural. That's always something I can take with me knowing, yeah. okay, I can do everything I need to do without the assistance of PEDs. And, you know, to some people it might not mean anything, but to me it meant quite a lot because then that I can all say, uh, also to clients that I, that I coach, if I see that they have talent, I always tell them, try to max out your potential as a natural. And when you then start to use, it's going to accelerate that much more. But you also are that much more experienced and you know more what to expect. You know how to train, you know how to eat. So when you then use, it's going to be a better foundation for you to grow and you won't need as much at the beginning to get that much out of it, basically. And that's what I experienced as well. I mean, uh, from the first competition to the second competition, I gained 14 kilos during the contest prep, which is, I think, oh, <laughs> yeah, while dieting. <laughs> and when I showed up, it was the same show, but it was a higher pounds. level. Yeah, 30 pounds. So I, I got there again, and they were like, what happened to you? <laughs> what happened to you? Because <laughs> then I was, I, I was literally, it was one year ago that I went to that show. And then one year later, I showed up like a, as a completely different, different person. person. And uh, that's when I realized, okay, for me, it was normal because I compared myself to myself. And I still looked up to Jay Cutler, Ronnie Coleman, yeah. and I realized they are a lot bigger. So this must be normal. But then... When I won that competition again, I real and I was still a junior, and I literally beat everybody at the competition, mm -hmm. also people like 10, 20 years older. That's when I realized, okay, maybe I do have some kind of talent for this. And then I really went all out for it in terms of the, uh, the routine, what we, what we were talking about earlier, really locking things in and sacrificing like more of a social life to you know be my best as I can as a bodybuilder. And, and from that moment on, that's when things really started to uh, yeah. accelerate towards where I am right now, which uh, yeah, I'm just very happy and fortunate that I'm in this position right now, still quite young, already having two children. So that's also a thing like the burden that I used to have of thinking, okay, if I do this for a long time, will I be able to get children at all? Because mm -hmm. people were talking a lot yeah. about fertility I back then. And worry. yeah, and that's... Like you have two types of worrying. Either you have children and you worry that they will take away from your progress. But I think that's a lot less stressful than having to worry about even if you want children, even being able to have children in the back of your head. Every time that you inject something, you're like, is this bringing me closer to my ultimate goal in life? Do I really want to be just a bodybuilder or do I want to be like a father eventually? And will this contradict each other right now and that to me was the most difficult thing before i had children so after having children then things went uh, accelerated even even quicker even though sleep was impaired yes. in fact this prep right now is the first prep i've had since 2020 where i've had a solid nights of sleep i, that. The, the, I have two kids that, as well <laughs> yeah the moment that my uh, oldest kid got old enough where he didn't cry every night then my second child was born. So it kind of repeated itself for like another year. Yeah. And now it's finally at the time that I noticed that I made a lot of progress this year, simply, I think, because I've been able to get a good night's sleep, sleep. and nothing else really that. changed. So that is uh, another testament to how important recovery and sleep is. When I mean, you think as a bodybuilder, oh, I only need four hours or five hours. I'm going to grind through this cardio and stimulate myself to burn as, as much fat as possible yep. but it's doing actually nothing just laying in bed and sleeping that's going to bring you a lot more benefit yep. and progress yep. compared to getting up a few hours earlier and doing a lot more work so that's I what i realized that. this year Definitely. for sure yeah you said a couple really cool things i was natural as well for a long time i didn't touch anything until i was 39 so i i'm a big wow. fan of taking things until your genetic limit yeah. basically that's or great. you start to go the other direction yeah. Um, I think a lot of guys start stuff too early. Right. And I don't necessarily yeah. think it's an age thing. I, I've, you know, I, 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 your, your brain is not fully formed when you're a young, young guy, but I think it's more about, like you said, I think it's more about establishing a routine and learning mm -hmm. how food works and how the gym works and how yeah. your body responds to things. Because once you've added chemicals in there, it changes that game. And if you don't sure. know how your body's going to respond, the drugs mask this, and you might not realize that you're overtraining or undertraining. Yeah. or not yeah. eating enough or eating too much, right? And, and, you know, when you do this, when you've seen success 
naturally, at least to an extent, it kind of teaches you how to do this stuff. So you know that you're not reliant on those things as well. You could easily stop and do it natural and still do it well if you had to. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, 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 the only thing I regret is like back then, the getting a blood panel wasn't really talked about as much. Yeah. Of course, I had a coach back then, but it was more a guy who helped me out rather than an actual coach who, who had a lot of knowledge. Yeah. So, of course, he helped me train. He helped me with a diet, but I, you know, I missed a lot of the knowledge I have right now. Whenever someone decides to use something, I always tell them, get a, a reference blood panel to know, okay, these are my natural levels, not just your hormones, but also Everything. where's my cholesterol at? Is HDL maybe already low from an uh, hereditary uh, standpoint? Like yeah. maybe my entire family has this already, but it doesn't really affect my health outcomes because LDL is also low. But once you start using, an HDL is still low, but LDL is now increased. You know you can only focus on the LDL getting that low, and the HDL was low yeah. already, so you don't have to stress about that as much. And the same for like kidneys and liver, yep. just to know an hem hematocrit, for example, just to know, okay, these are the my baseline. base levels. Yeah. But I was very curious, was my testosterone or my estrogen, how high or low was it before I started? And what was truly my baseline? To know, I think that's going to help you a little bit when you're cruising, for example, in between mm -hmm. shows or stuff like this, yep. to know, okay, I know what my baseline was. And I know how much progress I already made. Yes, we can know we can hold it. Yeah, then I know. Okay, this is the act, the minimal amount that I want it to be, but I don't need to go twice as high as this. For so no I would actually then know what numbers to play with. And right now, it's all as always. Okay, I do want to do the minimum I can, but then the back of your mind is like maybe it's too low. You never, you're never sure. You're doing the Olympia. You want to eke out as much progress as you can, but you also want to be healthy. So right. that, that's the only thing that's still missing. It's like the initial blood test. I've done a lot of them over the years, of course. I have to base it on now. Yeah, yeah. I don't have really anything to base it on because my HDL, for example, the, since the first blood test I've ever done was already below the uh, minimal level, but LDL was all, always very low, like so low. Well, you're that healthy. That, that, your diet. Yeah, yeah. It, it, like I also, there is a, a clinic here in the Netherlands, the first one of which in America there are dozens. But here, there's a clinic specialized in bodybuilders who use anabolics, and they do blood tests. And with the context of you being a, a bodybuilder who uses, so they actually give advice okay. regarding, like, you have to do How an to. intake, you, your entire history of what you've used in the past, what you're using now. And then with the results of the blood test, they tell you, okay, this is normal in this context, or this is too high. And he actually told me this is shockingly normal. This is like... Like uh, it's like uh, unexpected with what you're doing right now, basically as a bodybuilder, being a bodybuilder for so long, like hematocrit being like well below the the maximum limit, like LDL being very low, cystatin C being nice and high, like everything was pretty much good. And I'm not saying this just to say, oh, look at how healthy I am, but I'm referring back to the nutrition. Like you can eat very healthily, but once you see the results that it yields, yeah. it motivates you even more that, hey, it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. Like year in, year out, if you eat healthily, it's not just thinking that you're, it's not just a placebo, it's actually happening in the blood panel itself. And that really motivates me to keep it up and keep inspiring people to do it as well. Because you have to, if you give the body what it needs to fix itself, to keep itself healthy, it will be able to, as long as everything uh, works correctly and it has enough of everything basically. So I'm pretty sure you're familiar with chronometer that, uh, that like, it's like a, my fitness pal, mm -hmm. but then where you can see all your micronutrients also. So I like to plug that in. <laughs> and when Very I plug cool. in all my vegetables, I'm like a little bit above all the recommended amounts, I'm sure. yeah, but then I'm, I'm sure also like, okay, yeah, but, but I'm also like, okay, I do weigh almost twice as much as a regular person. I do have a lot more muscle mass and more active. So these, like for example, magnesium or something like these minerals can be a bit more than was recommended because yeah. I'm going to use them up quicker anyway. But that does give you 
like if you put in the effort and get in everything you need to and it actually shows up in your blood panel as well it's just a confirmation that you're doing the right thing yeah and uh, it just feels great to be at the olympia level and still and healthy like, have, have yeah. yeah and be healthy that's just a great feeling i know unfortunately nowadays that's seems to be the opposite right we, we keep losing a lot of guys yeah. you know that aren't you know whether it's some underlying cause or they're not getting checked up you know it's it's sad but i think that that's yeah. a really good point that people need to understand that it's very important to go get labs done you know and have True. doctors that you can trust you know and have a coach that you also can talk to about this stuff right your coach should be yeah. paying attention to your you know, like I only have one kidney. I was born that way, but I didn't learn that until I was 39. So if I wow. push the metric, you know, there are certain drugs that are harder on the kidneys. If I were to push certain things, it, it could easily die. Right. And it yeah, doesn't show up yeah. in blood work because it's functioning like the two. So it uh -huh. wouldn't, I wouldn't know until it's too late. Yeah. Right? You know, which again, if I had not had body scans and organ scans, I wouldn't know this. Yeah, that's yeah, that's why it's so important to spend time, you know, paying attention to their health before they they venture down this thing. Previously, we talked about pro level, you know, cycles and stuff and the amounts, and you could probably attest to this as well. I I found that amongst the pros that I know, there's ver varying degrees of drug use, right? I I don't know. There are lots of guys that use very little that get a ton yeah. out of it, and there's other guys that really use a ton. Right. But the average is probably somewhere in the middle and probably even less than most amateurs would use. Right. Yeah. Is that kind of what you see? That's true. I've, I, I know this quite well because I coach, I've coached a lot of amateur bodybuilders as well. And they expect that when I give them a cycle advice, that is going to be something ridiculous or something they, they would like to hear because they want to use exactly. more because they feel like well i'm being coached by an olympian so let's let's get on with the true cycles now. Here, right? yeah and their cycles like i coach people who used more than i've ever used myself and they are still at the level where i was like at the very beginning of my career in terms of muscularity so i'm like okay of course the genetic difference is there but then still you can you can get so much more progress out of so uh, much less usage basically because what we talked about before as well like the uh, like if the foundation is healthy there it needs to begin and on top of that you can use a little bit more and more and more as long as things remain healthy and when every organ works as it's supposed to work the progress will be a lot quicker like the digestion needs to be perfect like for example, the intestines, if you mess those up with a lot of orals, like Anadrol or Winstrol maybe even, or other anabolic steroids that, uh, that mess up the intestinal tract, the food and the nutrition is like the foundation of your whole you progress. So, and yeah, and we all, and even though it sounds old school, but so many guys still use the D-ball kickstart yeah. or the Anadrol pre-workout in the off-season for the pump. Like, it's all... A temporary, yep. it's like a temporary pump, and you think this feels great now, but in the foundation, nothing is really improving. So it's like a temporary boost in blood volume that you notice, and you think I'm making progress. Yeah, but once that effect is gone, you realize you've not made any progress at all because the anadrol inhibited you from absorbing all of those nutrients <laughs> you <laughs> where you were supposed to to make progress, yeah. and that's always going to be the foundation. So yeah, I, I mean, know that a lot of amateurs use a lot more than the pros do, and that's why they're at Olympia because they can get away with using less, yeah. so being more healthy and lasting longer on less drugs, basically, to be yeah. able to get to that level. And most guys use so much in the beginning that once they get to like a pro qualifier level, they keep being in the first color but never really getting to the pro level, and then they're stuck, and then they for the rest of their lives they feel like they but that we must be using even more to get to that yeah. level and that's how the mindset basically uh, exists at the amateur level thinking that all of the pros use so much yeah. even though the reality the is reality, yeah. as like you're saying more of the average basically yeah i mean i coach i i have a lot of clients at all different levels from lifestyle guys to pros and i i find that the a lot of the amateur the higher level amateur guys use and need more right than the pros yeah. 
I'm actually shocked sometimes of how little some of the pros need. You know, it's a it's a genetic thing. It's a receptor thing. They yeah. found you mentioned something before about your natural level of testosterone. They found that people that were high, the highest responders actually didn't necessarily have more hormones in their body. They had more androgen receptors. So it was the density mm -hmm. of those receptors so they could use all the hormones. And that's yeah. probably, again, why guys with the best genetics don't necessarily need more because every gram is going to go toward muscle tissue instead of being yeah, expressed yeah. as a side effect or it's excreted or broken down or it's turned to estrogen, DHT. You know, it's, it's you know, and I've said this a million times, but it is truly a genetic game like any other sport. I think that people really miss that, that it's, you're either born to do this stuff at that level or you're not. And that's really always yeah. been the case since John Grimmick all the way up to, you know, Chris Bumstead. These guys were born mm -hmm. slightly different than the average person, you know, and you as well. Yeah, I think maybe, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think you, if you're natural and you can already tell that you're converting a lot to DHT, you're already seeing male pattern baldness or you're seeing on the other side of the equation, gynecomastia or more estrogenic side effects from your natural testosterone levels. That to me already tells me that Yes, you can use more testosterone, but it's only going to shift to, into even more conversion right. to either of those hormones, yeah. which means genetically that's what's going to happen regardless. Yeah. And when I, I, like before I started using anything, I looked way younger than I actually yeah. was because yeah. I had, even now still, I can't grow like a full beard, for example. It's like the, the conversion to other hormones, as, except estrogen, which I did mm -hmm. have, uh, gynecomastia as a as a young guy already, unknowingly to me, but at one point in the Netherlands, they started to ban people who showed signs of, of gyno really? at a show. And I was I was 22 or 23, and I was fully prepped for the show, and I showed up and they were like, I'm sorry, you can't compete because we're seeing wow. like a gyno formation. And I was like, that that's when I realized that I even had it, because, but I already had it all, all my life. But that could that only that instance could actually indicate that your testosterone output as a teenager was quite high, yep. and your body was like, okay, this is pretty high. Let's convert some of it yeah, to estrogen. You can't deal with it. Yeah, yeah. And nowadays we also know that estrogen is quite anabolic and healthy mm -hmm. for you anyway. So to a if point, you, yeah. yeah, if you don't have gyno problems you might as well have it a bit higher especially in the off season to uh, help you facilitate more muscle growth less uh, joint pain for example mm -hmm. is good for bone mm -hmm. density mood, as well sleep. good for the brain good for uh, cholesterol yeah. levels yeah so it's, it has a lot of benefits but yeah to the earlier point i think you can see before even starting by looking at someone like the typical signs of high dht or high estrogen like if they get fat more easily like uh, an example, if you have like if you have uh, two brothers, and one of them they have pretty much they obviously have the same parents, so you might think the same genetics. But even still, one of the brothers they uh, and they eat pretty much the same diet. One of them is is just a bit fatter, as just uh, like you following the exact same diet basically, and you know that he's going to respond a little less favorably and stay as lean, and not stay as lean as the other guy, as the brother because he naturally already converts more to estrogen and and uh, his metabolism is just a bit slower to gain more fat. So you can already see that even though they're pretty much, like if you do uh, a DNA test, it's pr very, uh, very comparable, still small changes genetically can already have a big impact on your ultimate result as a bodybuilder when you start using stuff. Yep. Um, and it's like a two-way thing. It's not just how well you build muscle on it, but also how well can you tolerate the side effects from using. Because if you stay more healthy for longer, as I mentioned, you can actually uh, get away with a lot more or a lot less and get a lot more years of progress into you before you need to take action. Yep. So it's it's just a lot of factors, but it all comes down to genetics, basically. Yeah. And, and you probably line up with this pretty well too. It seems that the average guy from start of bodybuilding to the start of their bodybuilding career to a pro level is about a decade, right? Most guys, it takes about 10 years mm -hmm. of hard yeah. training and gear, which you started when you were 20, right? And you're 30 now. You, you turned to pro how many years ago? Three, four? I was 24 when I turned pro. Oh, six years but now. 
Yeah, yeah. Six years. Okay, I didn't realize. I've been following you for a long time. Then I didn't. Yeah, it was. A, it was. It was actually uh, interesting because I uh, was a super heavyweight in the Netherlands That's because right. classic physique that. wasn't a thing. Yep. So I won my super heavyweight class in the Netherlands, and I was officially the best bodybuilder amateur <laughs> in the Netherlands. And then the, a few months later, classic physique was introduced for the first time in Europe, in uh, London. So of course I was like, okay, let's go there. But I, it was actually a little too heavy for the classic physique cutoff. And I did a DEXA scan, and even with zero percent body fat, I was—I would still be too heavy. So I was like, "How am I? How am I going to do this?" But of course, water weight is a very big yep. factor. So we were—we managed to get below the weight limit. But that's the first classic physique show I did. That's when I won my pro card, and that's when I knew this is my calling, like classic mm -hmm. bodybuilding. I already did the classic poses as a super heavyweight, but there wasn't a class that truly appreciated like yep. what classic bodybuilding stands for. So yep. classic physique was the perfect fit. And back then they still had the bigger trunks, which I still That's right. I prefer because you I weren't, you weren't allowed. Yeah, you weren't allowed to show your glutes even. Yeah. And my coach said, if you hit a side chest, pull up your shorts a little bit so they can see your glutes. Right. But when I did yeah. that, I actually got a comment that I wasn't <laughs> supposed to do that. And it was all about the aesthetics, the proportions, yeah. the presentation. And very slowly, without even the rules changing, like the athletes themselves, they started to wear smaller and smaller shorts. And mm -hmm. that's the weird thing. It's like the athletes decided to be one smaller shorts, and then the rules changed because of it. Yep. It's not the other way around. Because I remember I in 2019, I wore the same trunks. I won the Romania Pro. And no one said a thing about my trunks. But one year later, I did the Olympia. I wore the exact same trunks that I won the Romania Pro at. It, at. And they were like, why are you wearing those grandma underwear? I'm like... This, this was my last winning Classic Physique trunks. What are you talking about? But it was because like Chris Bumstead and, uh, and, and Ralph Diesel, they all wore super small trunks all of a sudden, and, and mine looked twice as big in comparison. <laughs> but I was still with the mindset funny. of I'm a classic bodybuilder. I thought about Arnold Schwarzenegger and yeah. Lou Ferrigno Jenny wearing Padilla. like, yeah, they used regular. To it yeah, it wasn't about the glutes. And nowadays it's like, if I don't show lines when I do a back yep. double bicep on my glutes, I'm losing points. So it really exactly. went the other direction, but still it's, uh, it's a great class because it really forced me to be not just a best, better classic physique guy, but a better bodybuilder as well, because I also have to have um, now a massive physique, basically a massive yeah. back, big yes. legs, like deep striations everywhere in order to win a pro show. And it did bring actually a lot of challenge to the to the class rather than just okay i'm born with this shape i build this muscle mass and now i win automatically because it's not about conditioning anyway so if i'm just dry enough i'm always going to win so now it's also about the shape but also about like if you're a most conditioned guy the best shape and you're the biggest then you will win but it's yeah. the shape is always going to be a factor that is very important in the class. But uh, yeah, I was 24 when I had my first experience cool. with so being you were a pro. Yeah. It's, it's interesting too what you said about the conditioning too, like the Dubai Pro. Yeah, your conditioning was amazing. And when you look at that lineup, that original lineup on stage, your conditioning, at least in my opinion, was far above the other guys on stage. They Thank all look very much wet compared to you. It's kind of a, a shocker that you didn't. That you took third. Yeah. I, I was third, and it, um, you know, <laughs> I always, like Steve Weinberger was the head judge, so okay. I'm always going to agree with what he decides yeah. because he's the Olympia judge, and it's no use to say, oh, I should have won. So I always look at the facts, okay, what could be a reason that I lost? So then I look at the first place, like Ruff Diesel, obviously, no one can beat his presentation. So yes, I'm yes, like, okay, can I improve my presentation? Yes, I can still improve it with some poses, with some transitions. So that's what I'm going to do. That's the only thing I can truly look at a reason why he could have beat me. And then the number two was Fabio from Brazil. Mm -hmm. He had, he had, his back is unbelievable. Massive. His back double biceps is like a knockout. He defeats pretty much, I think right now, everybody in Classic Physique. If I didn't expect it. I thought he wouldn't be conditioned enough, but he surprised me a lot. But then in the front poses, you know, I do think I looked better than him, especially like in the front of a bicep. Yeah. And uh, like the side chest was the only like comparable pose. 
but uh, all of the other poses, I think that I did beat him. But maybe then the back double bicep was so overpowering that the judges were like, "Well, we got we, this guy simply deserves a few points above Wesley." So I have to look at the shows like this because if you look at it like I should have won, you already give up in trying yep. to improve yourself, and that's exactly. not what I'm about. I lost for a reason, and there's always something that the guy yeah. is better over you. They're not like there's always a reason. And that's what I look at. Okay, I can. I now I'm more motivated to train my back even more because I was under the impression that I had one of the best backs in classic physique. But now I see Fabio, and I was it's like, a little bit more you can. Yeah, just a bit more in the lower back, just a bit more in the thickness in the middle back. Okay, let's let's go for it. And the glutes is always going to be a thing. Yeah. Like nowadays, you need actually you big striated glutes, and it's not the striations like the conditioning that wasn't the, the problem, but it's more the size. Of the glutes that is the biggest difference between me and like a fabio or a chris bumstead they have uh, like a large glutes from i think squatting yeah. and, and doing certain deadlifts and uh bulgarian split squats with super heavy weights which honestly i haven't like deadlifting and and super heavy squatting i haven't done in the past as much as those guys so that could be one of the reasons yeah but and it's still interesting spend. spend a lot more time under the bar yeah. um developing that muscle group so that's something i look at as well okay if they want proportions in the whole body including the glutes and they actually want in my opinion slightly bigger glutes and would be aesthetically most pleasing then let's just go for it and, and build them build them up yeah i mean and i i'm putting myself in your head too because you've always been into the classic look the smaller glutes were always part of that right so it was probably not something you yeah. were really focusing on for years until now all of a sudden now you need to grow your glutes Right, but it was never True. Arnold never focused on his that was not something no cared about it wasn't even, yeah yeah it wasn't yeah. Even looked at no right and so it literally was hidden so Barry, no one cared right rich yeah Gasparri exactly like the first one to ever hike his shorts up yeah um i don't know if you wanted to talk about you know as a like a last thing is like some compound stuff like in a general sense of just you know why certain things are leveraged you know mm -hmm. sure um yeah. way the, you know, the way that we probably set up stuff and and the reason why we would employ certain things mm -hmm. uh, yeah sure thing i think it's you know, interesting like to I mean, talk about the logic and the science a little yeah. bit behind it uh, to give people more understanding of why some decisions are made regarding uh, the compound use for sure yeah. yeah i mean i know you can agree or disagree i'm guessing you're viewing it pretty similarly based on what you just said i know the the way I would typically do it in the off season is I would avoid orals. Orals are not something that mm -hmm. I would ever choose yeah. to use or to give my guys if I can avoid it. True. Outside of perhaps something pre workout, you know, for a little neural drive. But I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's typically a testosterone base, right? As much as someone can generally tolerate with outsides. Yeah. And then yeah. one, possibly two anabolics that are driving protein expression on top of that, you know, and then mm -hmm. the amount probably vary by person. Yeah. anywhere from you know a gram total to i mean i've known guys that have done as many as 10 grams but that's probably just as rare <laughs> as guys doing one gram <laughs> yeah i think so <laughs> like how would you how do you what are your thoughts on do you agree with that like as an off-season thing that seems like a pretty standard yeah, yeah actually my off-season and the prep they look quite similar but in the prep you modulate things a bit better because a bit different because if you use the same amount of testosterone in the off season as in the prep, it's more a visual thing that's going to mask your progress and weight progress and visual progress rather than it actually not that you're still making progress, but you can't see it as clearly. See it. It's the water. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just say in the off season, uh, you, you indeed you use as much testosterone as you can tolerate without the uh, estrogenic I side know. effects. Yeah. And things like this would be like increased blood pressure mm -hmm. or uh, like when you uh, go to bed and you take off your socks, if you see like ring. an <laughs> indent there, you're like, okay, I'm holding water. Maybe it has to do a little bit with my estrogen levels. Then you could do like a, a blood panel test to see if it's really out of, out of range. And if you confirmed, okay, it's really the estrogen, then you know, okay, this is my maximum testosterone dose. And you might add a DHT derivative on top like Mastron or Primo in mm -hmm. order to lower the impact of estrogen and to uh, indeed like you're saying add another anabolic for further growth and but in the off season i actually need to use a lot less compared to the contest prep it's food it's a yeah yeah it's, it's the food 
And honestly, also something else, when I cruise, I always do just uh, the minimal amount that I need to hold on to tissue to let literally, um, I feel so much better. And it actually it looked better, better for a while yeah. as well. It's like, why don't, don't I down. just, but what I do, I, you start to look better, but then you start to plateau in your strength, yeah, recovery. your performance in the gym, your, your, ap your appetite stays a little bit plateaued as well. So the only reason why I then start to increase testosterone is to increase my performance in the gym because ultimately you need to get stronger or at least progressively overload in the gym yep. in order to get more muscle growth, more hypertrophy. Yep. So usually if you if your body weight goes up, like the skill weight goes up, but your performance in the gym doesn't, then it's kind of a sign to increase the PD amount. But if your strength in the gym increases and your weight stays the same, you need to increase nutrition. Yep. So it's like, I don't view PEDs as something magical. I see it as one of the factors I need to increase to make progress. And when you, you decide whether to increase PEDs or, or uh, nutrition, depending on the type of progress you make or don't make, and you simply escalate this up until it's time for a contest prep again. Yep. And until you, like every time that you stop making progress, you see, okay, which one do I need to increase? Where do I need to change? And for me personally, it's not really like the contest prep simply begins when I'm 20 weeks out. And it's for me, the off season is automatically dictated by the next contest I'm going to do. Correct. Especially now I do pr quite a lot of competitions because I'm already at a level where I'm like, I'm not going to waste a year of off season and not doing competitions when I'm pretty much muscle maturity level and development level, I'm ready to compete with the best guys. And I don't need a super long off season because I'm already close to the weight limit. So that's why the off season, the escalation stops automatically once Wait, I'm fine. pretty much to the contest prep time. And then I go to a, a holding phase, basically lowering the PD amount, mm -hmm. going to a cruise with only testosterone, no orals at all in the whole off season because it doesn't serve anything for me and it only brings down health markers yeah. and I can increase strength and performance with like, if I escalate like PEDs, it's only like 50 to hundred milligrams a week. Yeah. If yeah, that, because sometimes it takes two weeks to do an increase like this. And then, yeah, let's just say it might be in between one and one and a half grams max in the off season that I get up to. Nowadays, and I also know that you mentioned before, yes, that's what you're using now, but what did you use to build up your muscle mass? I might be a boring exception because yeah. I've never really had to use that much. I used the, the, the time that I used the most was in a contest prep before, and I looked the worst. Yeah, that's when, like, you we all do it once at least once yeah, to toxic. see. Does this actually bring more to my physique than if I don't? And it only made my physique look more watery. I actually went down quicker in weight because I thought, okay, I'm using more so I can eat less to drop more fat, but it works the other way around. Nutrition will always be such a more important factor than no matter how much drugs you use that you want to keep your food as high as possible and your training performance as high as possible during the prep. And the only reason why you increase PEDs is to uphold your performance awesome. in the gym. And if you can't uphold it, then you simply drop the volume to make sure you're able to recover. And when you drop the volume and you have to drop the food to keep burning fat, you might increase certain anabolics again. And then you could put in an oral like an Anavar yeah. pre-workout to ensure that your performance in the gym stays elevated because that is the ultimate driving factor of keeping your muscle mass intact yep. so and if i would have to say in the contest prep i might use 30 percent more eventually compared to the off season because i think my contest prep like i've been dieting since may now because i've been doing multiple shows mm -hmm. so the contest prep takes longer <laughs> than the actual off season yep. so when I, yeah but i've been able to like at some point i stop escalating and then I'm upholding my performance, uh, maintaining performance. Right. That means maintaining muscle mass. And I've been at a super low body fat percentage for a couple of months now already. I think at least two months. So I don't need to dig much deeper than this. 
And when you are maintaining a body fat percentage rather than trying to go down, you also can drop a lot of the fat burners and it's automatically, you, you feel better, you are less fatigued and you actually require less drugs to have the same performance in the gym again. Yep. So yeah, it's, and when you, when you talked about which anabolics would that be, it's like always testosterone like in the off season, it's high, and you actually lower it during yeah, the prep to keep the visual, yeah, to to make sure you're not holding water to uh, that is masking your progress. Because I take pictures every single day, but if you're very close to the to the end and your testosterone is still very high, is this water weight that I'm seeing? Is this fat? Uh, how much weight can I actually still lose to get to my weight limit if I drop the testosterone? So I already drop it to a minimal dose basically at the very uh, at least a few months out already maybe two months mm -hmm. out and simply escalate mastron up the only reason why i don't use primo is because it's dosed with twice yes. the the you least uh, concentrate concentration so you need twice as much volume to inject and it's not as reliable if you don't have a great yes, source I agree with that 100%. and uh, and the price is simply a lot higher as well you pay if even if the price of mast and primo is the same you pay twice as much because the concentration is twice as little it's, yeah it's primo, twice as much to make it, the manufacturer yeah. talking about it, if not more yeah. yeah so um i think this combination worked great and you only like trend is of course a hot topic always to talk about, but I've experienced the lower you can keep that amount, the better it's going to be. 100%. Like I, I literally use it as a training performance driver. Like when you're, when you get to a point where your training performance in the gym starts to suffer, then adding a little bit of trend can already offset this. And it's also going to give you peace of mind that you can lower the diet even more yeah, and still be uh, anti, yeah, hold, hold the tissue. So, and I, of course, I've had uh, uh, one prep that I mentioned where I, the trend was a lot higher, and that's when I looked the worst yeah. out of all preps. Yeah. So it really, and it's probably because the sleep is impaired, exactly. night sweats, you feel, stuff. you just feel off. And to me, that's not the, that's not the way to go. It's not more healthy. It's, it's, it's more detrimental in every way possible. Yeah. So that's the minimal amount I want to use. And I actually drop it out completely once I reached a level of conditioning. And I can actually point. eat into the show, as you mentioned before. Then the food is there to uphold tissue and uphold performance. You don't need to trend anymore. So don't be scared to drop the amount of milligrams you're using. It's actually going to freshen your physique up. You're gonna and you're going to look better. You're going to be more healthy. It's going to cost less. It's less inflammation because you have to inject less, so it's all benefits. So uh, yeah, in yeah. A nutshell, basically, that's uh, that's what I like to do. Yeah, during I would off season and prep. And the uh, once the sleep goes down the toilet, right? If you're running 100 milligrams of trend a day and you can't sleep, you're not oh, going to look no. good. There's just no. you know, and when you bring it, you know, near that height, then there's serious inflammation, right? I think legs will get swollen. Just just weird. Your body's just toxic. Yeah, it's gross. Exactly. Better like. There was like a layer of water over my whole, I still have those pictures where I'm like, I'm super lean, but you can see there's like an inflammation layer on top, yeah. like right on top of the muscle below the skin. It's like a strange, like, I know it's not estrogen because that was tanked as well. No. yeah. So it's, it, it was, it's, it's weird. You can see your body, your body is trying to, to suffer through something. It's trying to offset something. It's just can't because you're too toxic. And that's something I think most bodybuilders, you simply have to learn once and then never again. Yeah, well, yeah. Once you see it, you don't want to repeat that method. Yeah, yeah. Man. Cool, man. Well, with that, I feel like we've gotten a lot from you. It's been really cool to talk to you, get to know you. Uh, Great. Definitely, would like to talk to you again about some more stuff. Yeah, for sure. You know, we could dive into some more science. Do you have anything else you want to say? Or, or well, and I'm just uh, super excited for the uh, for the Olympia. Basically, it's like for me. Like for many people, it's something unimaginable to go to a big show like this. But for me, it's I live in the Netherlands, a small country, small bodybuilding culture. And when I go to America, I go to like this time Orlando. It's like, even though it's not a bodybuilding mecca, it's still the environment, the gyms, the the American atmosphere to me is so different compared to where I live here. To me, it's like a dream. Every time I go there, I'm actually going to go with my entire family, so my children as well. So it's going to be a, an interesting plane ride. Yeah, uh, but yeah, it's 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 going to be great. I'm just very excited, and I'm going to do my very best 
to show yeah. what I'm capable of at the Olympia and hopefully inspire a lot of people to, uh, to eat more healthy as well, <laughs> to see what kind of results Definitely. you can yield. And I'm also going to do um, a blood panel right after the show cool. to really be transparent about, okay, this is a result of, uh, of a whole prep since yeah, pretty much a six month prep and to talk about that with people as well and to see uh, what's up basically and how I'm going to go about trying to bring them back into the range or maybe they could be quite nice already. Who knows? But we'll see. But yeah, that's going to be uh, lined up and uh, we'll be filming every single day at the Olympia. Just like we're talking about here, I'm going to show the routines, show the peak week, the loading phase, which I'm already excited about, of course. And uh, yeah, it's going to be great. So, uh, and thank you very much for having me on. I yeah, appreciate definitely, that. man. I'm honored. Uh, and best of luck to you in the Olympia. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Soon, man. All right. Take care.